Hi everyone, uh, and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this is our webinar on Christianity and Libertarianism with Dr. Norman Horn. Uh, he is the founder of LibertarianChristians.com and the uh, organizer of the Christians for Liberty Conference that's coming up uh, this August. And uh, without further ado, because I think he's going to tell you a little bit more about himself, uh, Norman Horn. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is awesome. I'm really excited to be presenting to you all at Liberty.me. Uh, I've known Jeff for a long time, and I've known Matt for a little while, and so it's really good to interact with them and to have uh, something put on that, that involves a, a collaborative effort between Liberty.me and what we're doing at LibertarianChristians.com. Uh, so tonight's topic is really a fairly general one on Christianity and Libertarianism. Uh, so to begin, I want to describe just a little bit about me, and uh, so you kind of know who you're talking to, and then we'll uh, address a number of topics regarding religion, libertarianism, and how Christian theology can interact with that. Uh, so first off, a little bit about me. Um, yes, I am this person who's been passed around in this very uh, unusual little meme. I have been, uh, I guess, memefied a few times now with this. Um, that was me back when I was a little younger. Uh, at a Students for Liberty conference a few years ago uh, while I was a PhD student at, in chemical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. I finished that uh, a couple of years ago and have been working since then. I also have a Master of Arts in Theological Studies uh, from Austin Graduate School of Theology and I'm a part-time minister as well. Uh, so I'm a full-time engineer, I minister on the side, and then I do this work with LibertarianChristians.com. I founded that back in 2008. And if, uh, if, in case you're interested, you can find out more about how I became a libertarian on that. But uh, it'll suffice to say that I got started reading Mises.org articles about, about uh, e economics and then just got uh, hooked on it. And it just became a steamroll effect ever since then. And I love what I do trying to promote liberty in this way. And I feel like this is, it's a great way uh, for a lot of different people to begin to promote liberty is to work with one of the a demographic that in many respects could be one of the greatest supporters of liberty, uh, that being Christians. Uh, so basically, libertarianchristians.com considers uh, us all, we consider ourselves on a mission from God. So there's Jake and Elwood for you. Uh, if you've never seen the Blues Brothers, you should totally check them out because they're on a mission from God too. Overall, what we, we have a few different theses. Uh, one is that Christians often have a very messed up view of government. Um, and in response to that, we also say that libertarianism ultimately is the most consistent application of Christian political thought. When you take into account sound theology, uh, theological history, church history, and, and then biblical exegesis. Uh, and then finally, so our purpose then is to explore the intersections of Christian theology and libertarian theory. Uh, and before we go any farther, I should say, um, as, we, as we go through a lot of these topics here, I hope you'll come up with some questions. I've only planned about you know, 20 to 30 minutes of material. I want to give you guys an opportunity to talk uh, to me, and, let's, uh, and we can have a conversation about um, some, of, some of the things that are, are on your mind. Uh, so hopefully, you're, throughout this presentation, there will be things that, you will, uh, that will come to mind that you'll want to ask. Write those down, send those to Matt, and we'll get those taken care of. Um, so moving on, let's begin with uh, some of the misconceptions that people have about Christianity. Uh, in, in general, uh, one of the things that people tend to say is that Christianity is some type of socialistic uh, religion. It, it requires socialism in order to operate. And that's just really not the case. Even the examples that people use from the Bible that sort of look like socialism really Aren't. And in fact, there's a lot more counterexamples that suggest that the exact opposite is, is true in terms of a general theology that Christianity espouses. Uh, Christianity also does not glorify violence and war, despite uh, the, how many American churches and, and, and even across the world have supported interventionism and war. Uh, Christianity itself is not really positive towards that. And a lot of people forget this. Uh, they forget that Jesus himself is the Prince of Peace, and so a major element of what we talk about is war and peace. Christianity does not advocate a theocratic state. Uh, it is not true uh, that every Christian is just, even Christian libertarians are seeking just to Christianize the government and make it do our own set of morals and impose that upon everybody else. Uh, that's, not the, that's not the way of Christ. That is not the way that Christians are to behave. 
Uh, finally, really Christianity contains no theory at all to justify the state. Even despite how some people consider and, and interpret Romans 13, uh, for instance, which is the most typical passage that Christians throw out with regards to government, there's really not really a good justification of the state that comes from that or from anywhere else in the Bible. And what I want to show you tonight is a different way of thinking about it. Uh, so for connections, however, that we have between libertarianism and Christian uh, philosophy, Christian theology, are as follows. Uh, Christianity really does support a libertarian theory of property rights. Strangely enough, the, the way that we think about property rights in libertarian theory very much coincides with, how, uh, with, with what the Bible has to say about it with regards to the homesteading principle and the fact that self-ownership and, and uh, personal property are, are very highly valued. As a result, Christianity really loves the free market and peaceful interaction. Despite what some people have said, uh, even re recently, with, for instance, in the Catholic Church, um, in, in many respects, they're, they're really misinterpreting uh, the way that the Bible talks about uh, peaceful interactions and what wealth is for. Uh, there, are there are criticisms of the rich, but really that's a, that's a whole other story uh, than just saying it's criticizing riches or money and whatnot. You know, again, you hear uh, sometimes say, you know, well, Christianity says that money is the root of all evil. Well, that's a complete misquotation, for instance. It's not that at all. It says that money is the root of many kinds of evil. And that's a very different kind of statement. And in fact, uh, what we do find in the Bible is very different with, when it comes to money. Uh, Christianity affirms that no one ought to receive special moral privileges of position. When we talk about check your privilege in the Bible, it's really about... Do you take power for yourself and use it to give yourself special moral permission to do things that otherwise would be considered wrong? Uh, there is no such thing as doing evil so that good may result in the Bible. That is not true. That is not something that we propose. Uh, and so that's what that's uh, one of the, a very important connection between real libertarian theory and real Christian theology. Finally, we also say that the state is a rebellion against uh, against God, the God-given nature to man and our purpose as human beings and as, as of created beings. So what does the Bible really say about the state? Well, I want to give you five things uh, that I think that you may find interesting or perhaps something you've never heard before, unless you're maybe a reader of libertarianchristians.com pretty often. So here, here are some things that the Bible says about the state. Let's see if my images come up well. Okay, first off, well, if you're gonna if you're going to talk about uh, the state in the Bible, we better start at the beginning, so let's go back to the book of Genesis. In Genesis 9 through chapters 9 through 11, uh, we hear about a, a couple of different characters and events. Uh, there's a person there called Nimrod who we hear about, and uh, Nimrod is, con is considered to be a, a, quote, mighty hunter before the Lord in many, in many uh, biblical translations of Genesis. However, that's really not the best translation uh, that you'll find there. In fact, uh, the better way to, to interpret that instead of hunter is a rebel. Uh, he's a mighty rebel before the Lord. And in fact, the, the, the similarity to the word hunter is there, but the way it's often interpreted, even by Jewish theologians, and this has a historical interpretation going back a long ways, is a hunter of men, in fact. Nimrod is also a king and is considered to be the first king of Babylon. Babylon is, uh, in a sense, the first grand city-state or, uh, or, or kingdom in the Bible, and that's where we find the Tower of Babel being built. The Tower of Babel story is, in fact, what we would consider an origin story of the state. Uh, and in fact, uh, throughout Christian the historic Christian theology and Jewish theology, it's been considered this way. And what, it, what is often interpreted as a result is that this Tower of Babel is, a, is essentially a means to aggrandize power to a centralized authority. And what better way of doing that than a massive public works project, right? My roads. Uh, anyway, in this case, it's my giant tall building. And in fact, what are they trying to do? They're trying to build this giant building in order to reach to the heavens. Uh, and, in, and in a sense, compete with God. Um, so what, we're, what we find here is that the best interpretation that we have of the Tower of Babel is that it originates in rebellion, the state originates in rebellion against God. The result is that not only does this, di does this distance us from God, ultimately it also pit pits us against each other. And that's the significance of uh, all of the, the, the tongues being, 
being given uh, to the men in order to stop the project. This, this is why, you know, when they say this is the origin of different languages, it's also the origin of why we're all so against each other for so long. And there's a, and, and I don't want to belabor the point there, um, but really the, the crux of the matter is that the, the Tower of Babel is the origin story of the state, and it originates in rebellion against God. Uh, in Exodus, one of the things that we, we find in the book of Exodus is the liberation of the Hebrews, uh, and the, the nation that eventually becomes the full nation of Israel. And what we find here is that when, when Moses tells Pharaoh to let my people go, this is God speaking through him saying, I am on the side of the oppressed ones. The, the, the slaves, of the, the Hebrew slaves of Israel who were captive in Egypt uh, were the least of all peoples, it, it says other, elsewhere in the Bible. And this is, in many respects, meant to, dis, meant to display God's love of the oppressed people and his watch upon them. Uh, God is against empire in this because he, he, empires uh, take over people, they enslave them, they oppress people. Uh, and so what we find here really throughout the story of Genesis and, and Exodus is that God consistently sides with those who are oppressed by government. And it doesn't give a favorable view towards government as a result. Uh, later on, if we go a little farther, once the, Is the Israelite nation has been established for a little longer, uh, they begin to rebel against God even more. And then they say, well, we want to look like the other nations around us. We want a king. And so the prophet of God uh, at the time, Samuel, uh, says some really interesting things to the Israelites when they, when they come to him and say, make us a king. Uh, bring us a king. Let us look like other nations. And God says, okay, let them have it. But tell them what it's going to be like. And what Samuel says is that if you're going to get a king, then this is what's going to happen. He's going to tax you. He is going to take your land. He's going to take your crops. He's going to take your women. He's going to make them your wives. He's going to draft you in an army. He's going to make you fight in, your, in his wars. And it's amazing what the result is. Consistently, even the good kings of Israel are really pretty wretched. They do terrible things. David murders a man in order to get to his wife, who he can, uh, the, the, the murdered person's wife, that is, so he can sleep with her. It's crazy. The wisest man in the world, according to Scripture, is Solomon, David's son, resulted from that marriage, in fact. Uh, Solomon, David's son, the wisest man in the world, ends up tearing the kingdom apart. Uh, based upon his policies. And this is a, meant to be the wisest person in the world. This is a really interesting lesson in public choice theory when you think about it, that even the smartest people you can imagine, putting them in positions of massive power, ultimately ends up causing chaos as a result. So if you, and, and then, oh, and these are the good kings. You want to look at the bad ones? <laughs> when you start looking at the, the, the really awful kings, uh, that that occurred in the in the in First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and the Chronicles. It gets even worse. Um, so the point, in many respects, is that there is no way to put a really good human king into power and have a good result. And it doesn't get much better as we find when you start looking at, at democracy, even as as uh, as we learn later on. Uh, ultimately, what we find is the lesson of the kings of Israel is that governments inevitably tyrannize their people. It doesn't seem to matter. Uh, what kind of king they are. In, invariably, power corrupts, and that is the lesson that we find. Moving on to the New Testament, uh, you would think, you would think that perhaps, perhaps God's Son himself might be able to use the power of government in order to do something good. But this is something that is actually offered to him at one point, and in what we find in, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 4, that uh, Satan himself, when he tempts Jesus, the third temptation is that he basically looks across the kingdoms of the earth and Satan tells Jesus, look at these kingdoms. All of them belong to me. And if you bow down and worship me, son of God, I will give them to you. Now, you might think for a second, Satan is a liar. Uh, perhaps then this is just another trick. But if it were that way, why did Jesus respond the way that he did? Uh, Jesus does not respond to Satan, uh, well, you're, you're, you couldn't even do that if you tried. Um, that's not even an option. I don't understand even the, the, the offer. It, none of this belongs to you anyway. But that's not what he says. He says, 
uh, never essentially would I would I worship you, Satan. I am to worship the Lord uh, God and serve him only. Uh, so this response uh, actually in many respects tells us exactly what the state is, is that the state ultimately, uh, the kingdoms of earth, belong to Satan. Now finally, in the book of Revelation, uh, we find some very interesting symbolism in there that has a lot to do with the way we view government. Now, contrary to a lot of theologians uh, who talk about uh, Revelation as being only about the end of the world, uh, that it's only a prophecy about the end of the world and nothing else, uh, that's where we get theologies of rapture and whatnot and apocalypse wars and stuff like that. Okay, that's fine, and there, you know, perhaps there's a place for that interpretation. But really, the historic, the historical way that theologians in the in in church tradition have looked at, at Revelation is that it's actually referring more to Rome than it is to the future. If it's referring to the future at all, it's really in symbolic gestures rather than distinct prophecy of what exactly will happen. And so the way that, that these people have interpreted uh, before is that, the, that Babylon, it really is representative of Rome. And the symbol uh, that it ultimately refers to is human government in general. Same for the beast uh, that we that we read about in the book of Revelation. It's symbolic of human government. Now, what happens in the book of Revelation is that Babylon and the beast are ultimately defeated. And so the 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 brief way of interpreting the book of Revelation in this regard is really to say that the ultimate destiny of the state is just destruction. Uh, that ultimately the state is defeated by God. Now, why would it need to be defeated if it could be Christianized and made really good and just populated with the right people and then made the right way and therefore, okay, well, then God will just come in and say, good job, President so-and-so, you did great, now we're ready for the end times to occur and then whatever happens, happens. It doesn't make any sense in this regard if, if this is the way we're going to interpret it. Uh, so ultimately, from beginning of the book of Genesis to the end of the Bible and Revelation, what we find is that the state is the enemy of God. The state is, is always acting contrary to the will of God, and its destiny ultimately is destruction. Now, you'll note for a second that I have not addressed uh, the number one passage that a lot of people bring up when we start talking about Christianity and government, and that's the book of Romans in chapter 13. But we don't need to start there. In fact, we ought not start in Romans 13 when we have so much other information to inform us about what a proper theology of the state looks like from the Bible. So after we take a look at all these other passages, now it's appropriate to go back to Romans 13 and ask the question of what is this all about? Now, if you're not too familiar with the book of Romans and, and what this text is, well, this is the passage that you, again, you, you typically hear this thrown out. It begins by saying everybody needs to submit to the governing authorities. The, the authorities that exist have been established by God. But if you look at, at all these other uh, pieces of information as to this is, this is really what the theology of the state is going to be, there's a better interpretation that we can take of Romans 13. Ultimately, what, it's, what Romans 13 is saying is that the state is just not outside of God's plan. Um, that that's no justification for its existence. The fact that the authorities have been established or uh, by God is no different than saying that, well, Satan himself is established by God. Satan is not outside of God's plan. The evil actions of humans are not outside of God's plan. Uh, so don't worry about the state in the, same, in the same way that you don't worry about Satan. Yes, it's a terrible thing, and yes, we should oppose it, just as we should oppose sin, just as we should oppose Satan. But it's not some sort of justification for the state's existence. In other words, this is not some type of abstract text that we can then uh, just pull out and, and say, well, this obviously means that all governments that are established by God and are good and are rewarding good people and, and punishing the evildoer. Yes, that's something that happens sometimes, but oftentimes we know that is certainly not the case. We do need to look at the context of this passage. Um, if, you, if we were to think about the context of the passage and realize that, well, the powers that be at that time established by God were Nero and Herod, well, that would read a little differently, wouldn't it? What if instead of saying everyone uh, must submit to the, to the authorities, everybody, the authorities that exist have been established by God, what if we started talking about everyone must submit to Nero and Herod because Nero and Herod uh, 
have been established by God, and Nero and Herod punish the evildoer and reward the good person. It gets a little odd, considering that we know that Nero was one of the uh, foremost persecutors of Christians out there. In many respects, then, the way we should look at this text is that Paul is advocating a prudential look uh, towards government. That the reason that we want to, uh, that we pay our taxes and not try and cause uh, massive trouble with the state, the reason we don't want to irritate it in immensely is because if we do that, it's going to be a big problem to, to us. We are going to get persecuted as a result and for not a, a good reason in this case. The reason, if we're going to get persecuted as, at all as Christians, it ought to be because of our support and promotion of the gospel, not because I didn't pay my taxes. Hmm. Yes, you may, taxation is theft. Uh, yes, you don't have, uh, you shouldn't have to pay it. Uh, the state has no right to your money, uh, has no right to your productivity. Um, but what we really ought to be, what we really ought to have at, form, at foremost and forefront of our minds is the promotion of the gospel. And so uh, that's, that's really what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, you newfound Christians and your newfound sense of freedom, don't go off and just become political dissidents. Uh, th take the long view. Take the long view of things and realize that the ultimate way of which to change the world is to promote the gospel, to promote good thinking, to promote reason, to promote good things rather than play their game of politics. Okay, so what does a, a Christian libertarianism look like then? Uh, well, besides the fundamentals of libertarian theory that, we've, that we all know well and hold dear in our hearts, uh, there are some additional things that I think are important as we build up a Christian libertarian philosophy. And so I have a kind of a diagram here of things I, would, I, I think are important and useful in thinking about. Uh, so first off, uh, we have... That, that it contains a theological critique of statism and the superiority of the kingdom of God. That's the first thing that, that we're concerned about here, uh, is that we need to be developing uh, our, our biblical exegesis and critique of statism through the Bible, through sound theology, and recognize and promote the superiority of the kingdom of God above that of states. Uh, secondly, uh, my animations aren't exactly working out here as well as I was hoping, so let's just show the whole thing. Um, so an additional part of that is that we need a biblical theology of property rights in the free market. Uh, these often will go hand in hand with one another, and they'll feed back upon one another. What we realize is that if we have a proper biblical theology of property rights, that says something about what the state is allowed morally to do. And in fact, if you agree with, uh, with the more anarchistic way of thinking, the state does, has no justification and right to do anything at all. It should not exist, in fact, because it is in rebellion to God, and it does nothing other than oppress people. And those, again, those feedback on one another. And from that, we can lead to a biblical theology of personal liberty and moral decision-making. Uh, what, we, what we understand, then, is that, well, people ought to have personal liberty um, because they have... Uh, self-ownership because they have personal property rights and because they ought to be free to interact on the market. Um, this necessitates a view of personal liberty. And it also means that we take a potentially different view of moral decision making. Instead of trying to enforce our morals upon other people, we ought to be seeking to persuade them. We ought to be seeking to teach rather than force. Um, so we find in many respects, and this is where my little orange bar on the left side, we find that this is very, that this, these theology uh, points that we're, we're considering uh, have a great concordance with natural law and libertarian ethics. Uh, in other words, we see these running parallel to one another, and we see, oh, this is great. We actually have a, we have a, um, a working together of Christian theology and libertarian theory here. And so on the right, what I have are, are just a variety of different battlegrounds where each of these things can come into play. Uh, and so under our theological critique of statism, well, we ought to be uh, consistently opposing war and promoting peace uh, between nations. Uh, we'll need to deal with a lot of biblical interpretation that is faulty and flawed throughout, uh, especially the 20th century, but all throughout Christian history. We've seen uh, various aberrations of this. Uh, we need to critique civil religion and how nationalism seems to infect the church oftentimes. And then we need to take a better view of law. We need to oppose positivist law and support natural law. Uh, we need to be pro-economic freedom and immigration. We need to deal with, with social justice issues and the way that the church sometimes promotes these things wrongly. 
and likewise with environmental issues. And of course, we need to oppose the war on drugs and oppose uh, the, uh, the uh, prohibition of victimless crimes. And, and then, of course, there are other things that we could talk about there, too, but you can see that. Um, so where do we go from here? I want to wrap up with a, with a few uh, kind of recommendations. I'm speaking very specifically to Christians here um, in many respects. Um, as Christians, we need to continue to expose the evils of the state to the church. Now, this is a tricky thing to do, and, and we have to be very careful as to how we do this, because we're not trying to start a new church. We're not trying to, uh, to just uh, define a bunch of people out of the Christian faith by the differences in theology that we have. Uh, we need to seek to do something a little better than that, to be more inclusive and to work together. Uh, and, and part of that is building a comprehensive political theology. Uh, again, we're promoting the virtues of the marketplace, and we're emphasizing the importance of personal liberty, and we're, tr and we're trying to promote the kingdom of God and above and beyond the kingdoms of men. Uh, we're what we also need to do is we need to recognize that we're missing out on a lot of great anti-state Christian thinkers, and, uh, and that we need to build up new ones. A lot of atheist criticisms of, of Christians with regards to liberty is that, well, Christianity can't support libertarianism. But really, when it comes down to it, Christians have been some of the greatest supporters of liberty in history. And atheists, in some cases, have been very poor at doing this uh, as well. So... I don't think it's fair necessarily to uh, to either say that Christians are, are poor at promoting liberty or even that atheists are that way. We can work together on this, and we and what we can do is is by working together we can come to a better understanding of each other. Uh, social change ultimately happens when the war of ideas is won, and that's what we're seeking to do here. We're seeking to win a war of ideas within the church today, and to do that we have to we have to uh, be vigilant and work towards educating ourselves and educating others about better ideas that are out there. So here are some attitudes that I find I have had to embrace over time and that perhaps will encourage you as Christians in the church today, uh, you know, as you interact with other Christians and they're trying to promote these ideas. Maybe this will help you as well. You're going to have to get used to being uncomfortable. Uh, oftentimes, you will be the only libertarian in a church, or at least you may be, or you may find out there are others there too who are being silent. Um, so you're going to have to get used to being in uncomfortable situations and uh, potentially, you know, you're going to have to say some things you, that you might not have thought that you've been able to say before. Uh, you need to hold yourself to the highest level of intellectual and moral integrity. And the reason for this is that uh, we're fighting a really tough battle here. We're, we're uh, dealing with some of the most deeply ingrained beliefs of some people, and that's going to challenge a lot of people and make them very uncomfortable, too. They're going to challenge you intellectually, and they're going to try to impinge your, your personal integrity as a result. And so you need to show them that you're the type of person that exemplifies the libertarian uh, ideal, that is in, exemplifying a Christian libertarian ideal as well. And so if you can do that, you're going to be more successful, and you're going to be happier as a result as well. You're going to have to learn a lot of patience, and you're going to have to learn gentleness when correcting people. Because again... These are very deeply held ideas uh, and, and beliefs by a lot of these Christians. To, th to many Christians, to not be conservative is like anathema to them. They don't understand how you could do anything else. And so you're going to have to be very patient and gentle as you show them there is a different way of thinking. Uh, and the same thing will happen with the Christian left as well. Believe me, I've seen it. Uh, so remember, you're part of a remnant. If you've never read uh, Albert J. Knox's essay called Isaiah's Job, uh, or as, as I like to joke, or Isaiah's Job, you know, ah, okay, bad, bad Christian joke. Um, he talks about being the remnant, and the remnant are those people who preserve ideas of liberty. There, we have always been present in the church. There has never been a time when Christian libertarians have not been around, who, that there have been Christians who have opposed the state and opposed oppression. Uh, we are now going to take up that banner, and I hope that you're going to join, uh, if you're not already there, that you'll join us in that. And then finally, remember to be a happy warrior. Uh, be like Murray Rothbard in this. Be the happy warrior. Uh, it's, it's very tough to do what we do, and it's going to take a lot of time. We probably will not see victory in our lifetime, but that's okay. We're promoting the truth, and when you're on the, uh, when you're on the right side of history and the right side of ideas, there's really nothing like it, and uh, truth is always with you. Uh, so what do you need to do? Uh, keep learning. 
Uh, learn everything you can. Keep learning theology, history, science, rhetoric. Work as hard as you can in order to, to become the type of person who can, uh, who can explain these ideas in good ways that will persuade people. And of course, be a good producer. Um, don't just try and, uh, and be lazy, but show people that the libertarian world is one of production and flourishing. Uh, and, and do this by, and show them this by being the one improved unit. I'm, I know that Jeff Tucker's talked about this in the past and a lot of other people have. If you can focus on improving yourself, being a good producer, uh, do great things with your life, that will encourage people to join you. Because what is more attractive than someone who loves what they do, is productive, and is doing great things with their life in every area? Uh, finally, try to connect with other Christian libertarians. And to, there's a great, uh, there's a great uh, community that's being built up right now around Facebook, around Twitter, and we're trying to build it up in even more ways. I want to tell you a little bit, bit about that as I close uh, here. I've, I've spent a little too much time on this, but I want to uh, give you a few invitations here to try and get you to potentially connect with more Christian libertarians out there so that you can build each other up. First off, I want to tell you a little bit about the Christians for Liberty Conference. Uh, you can find this at libertarianchristians.com slash CFL. I invite all of you to come and join us in Austin, Texas, this August 2nd of 2014, uh, where we are hosting at St. Edwards University, the first ever Christians for Liberty Conference. Uh, we're doing this with a lot of support from Students for Liberty and others. Uh, we're going to have a ton of really great speakers there, including uh, uh, David Thoreau from the Independent Institute, a number of libertarianchristians.com writers. Uh, you'll see even uh, people like Representative David Simpson from Texas, the man who opposed the TSA. Uh, he's a great guy. I, I like to call him the Ron Paul of the Texas legislature. He is a super fellow. Uh, I've known him for a number of years now. He's just great. Um, he's very much a Christian libertarian and actually reads libertarianchristians.com, in fact. Uh, so he's really cool. we got a number of other people coming uh, from a variety of different organizations, a lot of pastors, a lot of uh, uh, just uh, good thinkers and solid uh, speakers. So we really hope that you'll come for the, for the fellowship, for bringing uh, a bunch of Christian libertarians together so that we can all build each other up, educate each other, and start something big. Uh, we're going to try and spearhead something potentially even bigger as a result of this. So I would love to invite you all to come and check that out again. Just go to libertarianchristians.com and you'll find it there, slash CFL. Come to libertarianchristians.com. Please come and like us on Facebook as well. Uh, we hope that you'll you know you'll do that. Help support us. Share our material with your friends and family. Even if you're not a Christian, uh, we hope that you'll we'll, you'll take a look at our material. Share it with your friends and family who are who are not libertarians, but perhaps they're Christians. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Norman Horn. And uh, again, I just thank you so much for being here and for listening. I hope that you found this encouraging. I hope that you'll have some good questions. Let's uh, let's open it up to some questions, and I'll hopefully be able to answer as many of them as possible. And we'll try and end and, and in about 25 minutes here. So once again, thanks. Matt, uh, I guess, can you open this up for questions at this point? Here he comes, maybe. All right, uh, thanks so much. Uh, that was awesome. All right, if you have questions, you can add, ask them in text on the, uh, on the right. Or if you'd like to come on video to ask, you can click video chatting in the upper right and then click start your webcam and I'll be able to bring you on screen. Our first question is from Tiffany Madison, and uh, what is the number one counter-argument you receive from conservative Christians? Okay, uh, so I would say that in general, the number one thing that they tend to bring up is Romans 13. They say, how can you be a libertarian and say that, you know, well, you need to oppose the government because of this, that, and the other? Doesn't Romans 13 say that you just need to submit? Everybody needs to submit to the governing authorities because God established them. And that's, that's the most common counter argument that I hear, um, you know, from a biblical point of view. Now, from just sort of a sheer, uh, like, practical, like, a non-biblical thing, typically what they start, you know, the, the typical response is, isn't what you're proposing just anarchy, uh, you know, and what they mean by that is chaos, of course, not, not what we understand as being a real no rulers, anarcho-capitalism or something to that effect. Um, now, to that end, then at that point we start arguing from more of a uh, from more of a libertarian point of view, and we can just point out, well, look, there is actually a lot of reason to believe that the libertarian point of view here is so much better uh, than anything that the that the conservative argument would bring forward. That's that's usually the number one. I'd probably I could probably you know name a, a ton of other arguments though if you want to hear those two, but we'll, we'll, we can uh, we can address those later. 
All right, uh, Joseph Knowles asks, how much do you think the non-aggression principle and the golden rule correspond to one another? That is a great question. Um, the way I like to talk about it is I think that they're kind of uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, the non-aggression principle really is a, is a negative ethic. That is, it's telling you what you ought not do. You are not to initiate force against others. The golden rule is a little different. The way it phrases it instead is treat others in the way that you want to be treated. So it's a little more of a positive ethic. It implies the negative one, um, but it's essentially it's raising the standard. And that's good for us Christians in many respects because it says, look, our, our golden rule ethic actually even encompasses uh, the, the, the non-aggression principle. Um, now, I haven't written a whole lot about how these things coincide. I've got some stuff that I've tried to start writing, and then I didn't like it. I threw it away. Uh, but, uh, but this is a great topic. It's one that I want to address in more detail in the future. Um, but I think that the summary of it is that I kind of look at it as two sides of the same coin or that one is somewhat encompassed by the other. That is, that the, the non-aggression principle is implied by the golden rule, but the golden rule raises the standard and, in a sense, uh, calls us Christians to something, that, uh, not just the non-aggression principle, but to raise the standard and do even more. Good? That's a great question. I love it. All right, our uh, next question is um, from Tiffany Madison. Again, uh, my Christian family are very pro-George W. Yeah. pro-war. How do you counter their pro-war stance and support for warlike leaders? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. Um, so when I started off, uh, you know, in my libertarian journey, um, as, it, as it often happens, uh, well, actually, okay, a lot of people say, you know, it usually begins with Ayn Rand. Well, it didn't begin with Ayn Rand for me, but it did begin with a girl. Uh, it turned out that... Um, when I got together with a girl who has eventually become my wife, uh, her father gave me a bunch of Mises.org articles. I started reading them. I got hooked. Even though my father-in-law really isn't a libertarian, he enjoyed the economics. Um, and so I started reading. I got hooked. I became a libertarian. And I sort of outed myself to my family shortly thereafter because I just felt like I, I kind of had to say this. And, and a big hang-up for me at the time was that I did support war. And I and I eventually I gained I became, you know, convinced I, I couldn't argue against myself anymore. Everything I tried to put, bring up as to why that we should be in a war, I couldn't support. It. So I had to switch that. So what happened when I approached my family with this? Well, I got cr criticized a lot. That's for one. That's one thing. Um, but that's OK. Uh, that's probably going to happen uh, with with. You know, when, whenever that happens to, to somebody who outs themselves as a libertarian to their family. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that I tried to say, and I think it was very successful with my parents, was that I, I told them, look, you taught me well. You taught me ethics. You taught me how to be a good person. What I'm telling you now is that I'm taking what you taught me to its logical conclusion. Uh, in fact, my parents were very much kind of conservative Christians, but they had a lot of libertarian ten tendencies. Uh, they opposed presidents. Uh, for the most part, uh, you know, it, it was, it's funny how much they inherently distrusted the government. So what I told them was that, look, I'm not doing something to try and rebel against you. I'm, I'm just taking what you taught me. I'm bringing it to its logical conclusion, even the way you look at war. And so I started with that and began, you know, because that's an affirmation of who they are. I'm not telling them, well, you're bad people because you support war. I'm telling them, look, you taught me well. I'm telling you that I'm just taking what you taught me and taking it to its logical conclusion. So when I began with that and I started from there explaining, here's what I've learned about this war. Here's what I've learned about war in general. Here's what I've learned about the state and why it's awful. Uh, that really resonated with them. And so I would think that a good way, especially if you have believer parents, um, you know, Christian parents who you know, perhaps they, they did give you a great upbringing. I hope they did. And, and if, that, if not, I'm sorry. Um, but for me, this is the way it worked out. And I hope that perhaps that story gives you a little bit of encouragement. I think that's a great way uh, to start off with people is appeal to the good things that they know and love and believe and try to start from there and say, look, let's just be more consistent in that. Um, of course, that doesn't help per se when they have potentially issues with uh you know, if they if they just inherently believe that 
all Muslims are evil or something, uh, that may take a different tactic. But often I find that if I appeal to the good that's already in them, I can have greater success. That uh, definitely res resonates with me because my parents, uh, my dad's a, a, a Southern Baptist pastor, and yeah, he taught me to be relentlessly logical, and he taught me sure. not to make excuses for doing wrong uh, or when anyone does wrong. And so yeah. when I became a libertarian, and you know, they were a little bit neocon, uh, kind of neocon light, they started reacting against that, and I was like, hey guys. Let's take take a second here. Um, you taught me not to make excuses for when people do things wrong. Yeah. Would this be wrong if I did it? Okay, what gives the government the right to do it? And I, I took them through. I probably read uh, took some stuff off of uh, libertarianchristians.com uh, for my Woo! responses to <laughs> Romans 13 and such. Anyway, we've got yeah. a ton of other questions. Um uh, Weberts asks, uh, what is the biblical case for property rights? Great question. Um, so first off, I'd say uh, it's very clear the value of the individual in, in the Bible, that we, are, we have personal responsibility for our actions, uh, that we are, we're going to be held accountable, and you can't do that without self-ownership, right? And so the first step is to recognize that the individual is viewed very distinctly in the Bible as being um, responsible for his actions, and uh, and 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 there and thereby must have the ability, um, essentially, to act in support of his life and in support of doing doing what is right and being freely able to come to God. Um, and so it begins there, but then we also have plenty of other uh, evidence in the, in the Scripture for how personal property and, he, and is to be. Uh, is to be regarded. Uh, the fact that we have one of a, a very distinct set of commandments in the Ten Commandments that uh, that suggest that you should not murder or you should not kill, that you should not steal, uh, that you should not uh, uh, view other people as ends to themselves. I'm sort of interpolating from this, the language about that you know you should not lust, don't objectify people, uh, don't don't covet your neighbor's stuff, and don't covet your neighbor's wife. Uh, all of this stuff suggests a form of ownership or of stewardship, if you will, um, over over stuff, over our life, over ourselves. Uh, and then this also is essentially assumed and pre presumed throughout the rest of the Bible. Whether you're looking at the book of Acts and in how uh, the, uh, the early Christians, even when they were sharing their possessions amongst each other, it was assumed that they owned it. And so if you... It, to, to somehow abrogate that from a sense of private property as an, under, as a, an understanding of Scripture is just complete poppycock. Um, and so there are plenty of other ways in which we can look at the principles of, of the books of the law, of the way that the prophets talk about uh, the, uh, the kings taking people's stuff, people, the, the uh, rulers taking people's land, the way that they drafted people and force them to do things, taking them as slaves. Um, there is actually a lot of great uh, scriptures that, oh, my screen just went black as I went to a screensaver, sorry. Um, uh, there, there are plenty of scriptures in the Bible that, that actually oppose slavery. Uh, all of this is, is indicative to me of an assumption of property rights. Besides the explicit mentions, uh, there is an assumption of property rights in the Bible. So I think it's not just, I can't point you to, you know, Hezekiah 14.3, hey, property rights are awesome. Yeah, I can't do that. But what I can do is point you to a lot of different areas where it builds the case sequentially. All right, our next question is from uh, David Panisi. How should we discern the difference between the secular stateless society and heavenly or natural law of God? Good question. Um, so I think that the best way to answer that is that the, the kingdom of God is not of this world. Um, and so the way that we, should, that, that we should even envision God as king is not as some sort of, you know, uh, handing down dictates uh, in order for the government to make it happen, um, but rather allowing, basically letting people act as they will, but within 
uh, essentially with freedom of conscience. Um, so the kingdom of God operates differently. It's a voluntary, uh, you know, it's a voluntary thing. You come to it voluntarily and you interact with it voluntarily. Um, and so I, if what you're referring to, though, is some sort of end of days thing, uh, something, you know, say, uh, you know, the, when the new heaven and new earth appear as is, uh, you know, proclaimed in Revelation 21 and, and beyond. Now, that's a little different. Um, certainly, the perfect world is one where, you know, where, where, we, uh, where we have God with us, you know, present at all times. And then, of course, you know, the way we understand it theologically is that, you know, once we are there, we will desire, our desires will be, will be pure. Um, we ourselves will be sinless. And we will be transformed in, and to be part of that, part of that society, if you will. So it, I'm not entirely certain how that exactly coincides with the secular stateless society. Um, and I'm not even sure I'm really answering the question extremely well, <laughs> but it's a, it's a difficult one uh, to really think about. Write a paper on it, man. We'll publish it. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, I don't know. I couldn't hear oh, you. Just realized my mic was, I, I turned my mic off in between questions, ah. and sometimes I'm dumb. Um, there are many, many atheist libertarians. No joke. What is your elevator yeah. speed for why theism and libertarianism are compatible? Okay. Um, first off, yes, there are a lot of atheist libertarians, but strangely enough, there are a lot of Christians out there. And a lot of the, the greatest libertarian leaders out there are Christians, whether you're talking about Ron Paul or somebody like Thomas Woods. And, I mean, even Jeffrey Tucker is, is, a, is Catholic, and, you know, he's, he understands this as well. Uh, so there are a ton of really wonderful people out there um, who are leaders in the libertarian community who are Christian. And uh, it's really a misnomer to say that they're just like, that it's some type of uber minority. Uh, oftentimes they're, they're not as vocal about their faith because they're not trying to just push it on you. We're not looking to push our faith on you. We want to, if you want to talk about it and you want to, you know, uh, to discuss it, we're willing to do that. Um, so elevator speech though. Uh, the, the quickest way I'd say is, is that the, the state itself is opposed to the will of God. Uh, and that's, that's the, the, the one sentence version. The state is the enemy of God. And the kingdom of God is not of this world, and it is certainly not the state. Uh, so that's the, the really quick answer. Then I would begin with, okay, the, the, the next question that naturally will come up from, from the atheist then is, what do you mean? I thought all Christians supported, you know, American nationalism, rah, rah, shish, boom, bah, you know, let's do this. Uh, that's when you begin to, to say, well, hold on a sec. Let's go to see what scripture really does say. And then you can bring up things like the Tower of Babel, 1 Samuel 7, Matthew 4, and etc. Uh, I think those are, that's a great way to start um, from a theological perspective. Um, you know, that's, that's I think, uh, the, the way I'd begin. So very much in line with what I've already pre presented tonight. All right. Uh, so we have a video game. Uh, oh, yeah, actually we do. Uh, it's uh, Philip Asari from Ghana. From Ghana? All right. Do we have a video? Hello. Hi, Philip. How are you doing? I'm fine. Sir. Good day. Uh, I wanted to know how the, the Christian for Liberty the 2014 conference, how can I be part of it whilst I'm in Africa? Uh, well, all you got to do is just sign up at libertarianchristians.com slash CFL. Um, it's open to anybody from the world. Uh, just all you got to do is get there, and you'll be, you're will be you welcome to come. Uh, we, we invite everybody from the world. It's totally fine if you want to come from Timbuktu or, you know, Podunk, Texas. <laughs> Today, uh, today to, you really make me to know that liberty is not for really uh, people who don't really go to church. It's for everybody because we are in Africa. More people are Christians. That means yeah. they really have to understand the liberty very, very well so that they can really know how they can go by their spiritual beliefs. Yeah, and it's interesting, um, Philip. 
uh, I, I track analytics on my site, and it is interesting the rise of interest from the continent of Africa in libertarianchristians.com. And I'm really happy to see that. Historically, you know, it has been primarily America and Canada, and then we've seen a pretty good amount of Mexico traffic and a really good amount of uh, traffic from England. Um, but more and more, we're beginning to see places like Africa and even China. Well, uh, thank God we're not blocked in China yet. <laughs> But uh, but we you know we we begin seeing a lot of traffic uh, from those areas and we're really thrilled to see that. Um, so you know I hope that you'll you know subscribe to the site and start taking our emails. Um, we'll do the best we can to support you with as much information as we can and try and give you sound theology and sound philosophy uh, in order to support you. Um, we're not just interested in promoting you know Christians for Liberty in America. This is Christians for Liberty in the world. Uh, liberty for all. All right, thank you, Philip. Okay, thank you. All right, our next question is from Andrew. Oh man, I've been doing so well with the last names, but I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a pass on this one. Uh, to me, Christianity requires libertarianism. You can't coerce salvation. Why do you think so many Christians try to legislate morality? I think they they do it for two reasons. Um, one is because Deep in their hearts, sometimes, uh, you know, they, they really do uh, have a, a, a designs for power. Okay, some some of these some Christians are just like that, and that is sin in their life, and they need to repent of it. You know, flat out. Some people have, on the other hand, they come at it with good motives. Um, for instance, I think a a, a hang up uh, for a lot of people is the war on drugs. Um, they don't seem to get that the war on drugs is really harmful and that it is, you know, they, they don't seem to be able to get past at first that drugs are not a legal issue, they're a health issue. Um, of course, you know, no one's going to uh, deny that if someone who is high on drugs, just like if they're, you know, drunk on alcohol and does something that aggresses against someone else, that they shouldn't be held responsible. Of course, we all believe that as libertarians. Um but abuse of drugs is not a legal issue. It's a health issue. And so one of the things I, I try to emphasize with Christians is that, look, what you want can be accomplished better under liberty than under statism. And so if, it, you, know, if you have good motives, if, you're in, if your intent is really to try and help people um, to, uh, to not have as many problems with drugs, to, uh, to try and end um, sexual promiscuity or something like that. You can do so better, not by initiating force, but by use of exactly what uh, God told us to do, which is to use the gospel to convert people rather than uh, put them in chains. And so uh, I think, again, uh, hopefully the person who you're talking to who wants to legislate morality, and, and by morality, I mean, we should keep in mind that any type of legislation is legislating morality in, in so many respects, unless it's some type of, you know, speed limit or something. That's not a speed limit is not a moral law. Contra Al Mohler and some of these other nut cases. Um, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> uh, contra many respectable theologians. Uh, <laughs> uh, not all laws are moral, but a lot, but almost all laws, you know, are in many cases moral. Um, if, the, if what they're trying to do with that type of legislation is under a good intention, appeal to what is good in them. They want to help people, show them how you can help people better under liberty. Thank you. Um, we've got our last question here from Mark Harris. How do you respond to those that claim the Bible is pro-war based on wars commanded by <laughs> God? In the Testament? Okay. Um, well, the... <laughs> Let's put it this way: If George W. Bush had a you know clear you know signed off uh, executive order from God to go to war, that would be a completely different story um, than what we get. There is no way, that even if even if you have some very positive view of war through the Old Testament, which I don't think you really do, um, you certainly cannot argue that that somehow justifies. All states going to war whenever they want. That, that this does not follow, and uh, as an as an argument of 
uh, period. So appeal to, to logic in this case, you cannot get to God supports the war in Iraq from God had a war in the Old Testament. And that makes no sense uh, on its face. But then again, you know, even even so, I'm not sure that it's really proper to say that God has some uh, uber positive view of war uh, waged by states based on Old Testament reading. All right, thank you so much, Norman. That was awesome. Um, everybody, check out Norman uh, on libertarianchristians.com and on uh, on he's got a profile on Liberty Me as well. And then check out the Christians for Liberty conference. I believe it's uh, August 3rd in Austin, Texas. I am hoping to be there and uh, hope to see some of you there as well. Our next session is tomorrow night at uh, 9.30 with Chuck Grimet. He's going to be doing a webinar on online security and privacy. So if you've got these pressing questions about how to keep out uh, both public and private criminals from your online life, definitely show up for that. And I uh, hope to see you all there. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Can I have a final again. word? Hey, I just wanted to uh, say, it I, looks like there may be some other questions, um, and I want to just say one last thing. I invite you to come to libertarianchristians.com and submit questions that you have to our FAQ section. Uh, again, it's just libertarianchristians.com slash FAQ, and I will try my best to get to them. Uh, we're doing crazy work right now prepping for the conference, uh, so it may take a while, but please come and check us out and find us on Facebook. Join our Facebook groups. And, uh, and we'll, we'll interact with you even more. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. See you all.